Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our first Naturalist Night of 2021. I'm Hillary with Newport Bay Conservancy, and I just have a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce tonight's speaker. We will be keeping you muted, but encourage you to ask questions throughout. So if you do have a question, you can either type it into the chat and I will ask your question, or you can raise your hand and I'll call on you and allow you to unmute yourself. Um, if you're not sure how to hand, along the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see a few different icons and the one on the right is labeled reactions. If you click on that, you will see the option to raise your hand. So with that out of the way, I'm excited to introduce tonight's speaker, Bettina Eastman. Bettina is a volunteer naturalist with us at Newport Bay Conservancy and a longtime volunteer at Sea and Sage Audubon, where among many other things, she is the Coastal Christmas Bird Count compiler. She has been birding for over 30 years and tonight she will be teaching us how to look at a bird with hopes of making an identification. So welcome, Bettina. Thank you, Hillary. You know, somewhere there is some back feedback or um, interference. So is everybody muted or is there someone using perhaps their screen and a phone or something? I wonder. So everyone should be muted. Um, I will also mute myself um, and see if that helps. Okay, I'm seeing um, Diane Grice doesn't have a mic and uh, or a muted mic, and neither did someone, uh, uh, Aletha. Anyway, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. So thank you everyone for coming. I see a lot of familiar faces. Thank you all so much for your support. Um, I have to be honest with you, um, Hillary and I kind of did this in a hurry. So, um, and believe it or not, um, out of all the things that I've lectured on, I've never lectured uh, on birds, or at least on this aspect of birding. I've done photography um, lectures in hopes of helping to educate photographers about um, how to photograph and wildlife without being a disturbance to wildlife. So I've done plenty of those lectures. But as far as teaching folks how to look at a bird and try to come up with um, field marks for identification is something new to me. So um, I would like to try to make this somewhat interactive this evening. So um, I hope you brought your pen and paper and perhaps a field guide. And um, we're going to kind of systematically try to go through this and we'll see how far we get. Um, I have quite a few slides, but um, sections I'll probably take slow and I hope you'll um, you know raise your hand and participate so let's see what we can come up with I am going to actually um, <clears throat> minimize my view of you all and I'm going to put you in another screen I have two screens here so how do I minimize my view, speaker view, there I go. And I'm gonna take this thread and I should be able to move it. No, it's not gonna let me know. Hmm. Before I was able to grab my gallery and move it. No, it's not letting me do that. So. Hi, Hillary, I'm wondering why I should be able to minimize this so that I can share just my screen and have my PowerPoint up. Anyway, let's try this. Okay, so I can't see you, just so you know. Oh, there you are, you are on my other screen. But please raise your hand and type something in the chat if you have a question and we will um, see where we get. So we might be at Upper Newport Bay and I don't remember drawing that circle on there. So maybe someone else is drawing, um, but um, hopefully 
we have an opportunity on a beautiful morning like this to do some birding. We're excited. But I'm, I'm going to need you to bear with me because this, in order to make sure this isn't super dry, I've tried to make it kind of fun. So how do we count and look at all those birds that we see? So I found this emoji and I realized that there's actually field marks if you look closely um, on these birds on the wire. And so I spent the time to go through, how many, raise your hands, how many of you guys see field marks? Do you guys see field marks? Can you think of anything that you could use? Okay, Peter's got some. So I went through and found field marks on these birds, like perhaps this crest or plume, or uh, sometimes called a top knot on this yellow bird. We could use that to separate it from the others on the line. We could also use this white belly on this large blue and red bird, but this bird over here has a white belly also. So what else might we use? Well, it has a light green chin, which is different from the other large bird with a white belly. And it also has this technical hook thingy <laughs> but it has this white slash um, going up near its throat. So that might be a field mark that differentiates it from these others. The big large bird has a rufous breast, so that's different. And this bird um, on the far right has a notched tail, but so does the one on the far left. And perhaps you might consider the one uh, here on the, just to the right of the rightmost bird, it might be considered to have a notched tail as well. Typically there's two halves to a tail and we'll talk about that later. So that's a little unique, um, obviously from a cartoon, but this bird hiding behind the other has some wing bars. So I hope you can see those little details. And believe it or not, if you look really closely, and that's sometimes what it takes when you're birding, this bird on the far right, its bill might be just a little bit thicker than some of the bills on these other birds. So perhaps that might be one of the field marks we need to look at. And lastly, there are several birds. I think this is my last field mark. Sometimes birds have larger eyes than other birds. And there's a good reason for that. And so this large blue bird otherwise maybe looks similar in shape and size to some of the other birds, but it might have a little bit of a larger eye. So what are we going to do if we have an actual bird in front of us? Does anybody, and I'm going to try to see how many people I can see on my screen here. Does anybody know what bird this is or have an idea of what bird this might be that's in the background of my photo here? You can raise your hand. I know Andrea's thinking really hard. Clara's on it. She's looking. Come on, you sparrows people. I know there's people in the sparrows class. Oh, 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 look at that. Lisa's got her hand up. Okay, Lisa, I'm going to. I don't know if I can unmute you, but Hillary, how do we unmute Lisa? Okay, I'm asking you to unmute. You should be able to unmute. What do you got? Uh, Vesper Sparrow. Okay, Vesper Sparrow, that's right. I'm gonna mute you again. Okay, so I think I heard someone else perhaps saying Vesper Sparrow also. Maybe someone in the background at Lisa's home. <laughs> anyway, that's a trick question because I don't expect you at this point to know that that's a Vesper Sparrow. But Lisa actually helps me do a count um, at a park um, for the city. We do a, a count um, every week actually. And um, so I know she works as a biologist too. So that's, she's got a little bit more experience than some of us. Anyway, um, we need to remember while looking at all these other um, attributes that birds may have, that there's quite a bit of variation 
even um, regardless of what we expect to see, there's reasons why what we expect to see might be different. Um, birds can vary with age. And so here we have a juvenile um, um, brown pelican on the left. And it, this is honestly the darkest brown pelican I've ever seen. It looked like that head was so black it had been through a fire. But um, on the right is an, uh, uh, it's, I don't know that I would say it's an adult necessarily, but it is older um, than the one on the left. And birds can vary with sex. So we, we call this sexual dimorphism, di meaning two, two morphs. So we have a male on the left and a female on the right. And as you can imagine, um, by the way, some of this might be very elementary. You guys may already know this, but it doesn't hurt to um, remind ourselves that um, one of the reasons why females are more drab in color in many species, not all, but many, um, because she's the one guarding the nest and protecting the eggs from predation. And if she was as pretty and flamboyant, let's say, as the male, then perhaps um, she would be easily found on that nest. So birds can vary with sex. And also birds vary with season. And there's different ways that that might happen. These are two California gnat catchers. Yes, they're both California gnat catchers. The one on the left is in the winter time. Um, coming up to breeding season, as you can see, it might be getting a little bit of black above its eyebrow and getting some um, coloration. But the one on the right is um, a breeding male and actually it was calling. So I don't remember that it was singing but it might've been at least calling. And here's another example of that phenomenon that some birds vary with season but this variation has to do and, and the California gnat catcher as well, has to do with molt. So these birds are actually molting por portions of their feathers, their neck and head feathers, and the, in this example of the American avocet. So in the winter time, you would see the one on the right, but in the springtime, for breeding purposes, you would see um, some degree of uh, molt like the birds on the left. And as you can see, the, uh, uh, the male, which actually there is um, another dimorphic thing I can tell you about in this photo. The male is the bird on the right and his bill is just a little bit straighter than the female who um, apparently is very receptive to courtship on the, on the left. She doesn't quite have this strong molt that he has at this time of the photo. So if you notice very carefully, her bill is just a little bit more up curved, um, uh, or we could say recurved than the male. So in the breeding season, you can often sex um, uh, the American avocet based on that bill shape. But some birds actually vary by season and um, we call that alternate plumage when they have a different looking plumage for the breeding season versus what they have um, for the wintering season. Some birds vary in actual feather wear. So like this European starling, the bird on the left is closer to the fall when it had just molted into a fresh set of feathers. And that fresh set of feathers has these edges or, um, yeah, I guess you'd say edges that we call chevrons that are tipped in white. And the head actually is often tipped in white. And as you can see, we'll learn later, these undertail coverts are also edged in white. But as the winter progresses, white is not as structurally strong or sound as other feather col uh, other colors on feathers. And so it wears off 
to reveal the black plumage of the bird on the right. So that's not quite as black as some people may remember starlings or recognize starlings to be, but it is wearing away the white portions of those feathers to reveal black. And um, the bill will uh, also change to yellow for the breeding season. So this wear is a different seasonal change than a molt. And actually, many people may know the saw, um, excuse me, the house sparrow. They're often uh, a backyard bird. And maybe you remember the house sparrow having a lot more black on its breast, but this too is a bird that in the fall has fresh plumage. It's just gone through a molt. And so that white wears away to reveal that black breast underneath. I wished I had a more advanced, uh, excuse me, feather wear photo, but I didn't have one. And also um, there is a seasonal uh, molt for waterfowl, especially where they go through what we call eclipse plumage. And in the fall, that even the males like this one on the left will molt part of its feathers to make it look more dull and drab, perhaps like a female, because it also will molt at the same time its flight feathers. And so for a period of a couple of weeks, while those flight feathers are out, it is flightless. And so in order to protect itself from predation, it goes through what we call eclipse plumage and it molts many of its feathers to make it drab and not quite so conspicuous so that it can be um, protected. And then it will come out of eclipse plumage and molt back into this beautiful um, full uh, male breeding plumage. This is not a female on the right. I, I was gonna throw a female photo in, but you know how we are. <laughs> we always are taking photographs of the pretty birds. <laughs> And I'm guilty for uh, not finding readily a photo of a female um, bird here. And another thing we should think about is the fact that there is individual variation amongst molt and birds and their timing. So these are two black-bellied plovers. They have arrived on our beaches from their breeding grounds. And in the breeding season, um, they get this beautiful black belly. I've not seen this in full breeding plumage um, yet, but they get this beautiful black plumage throughout their um, breast and belly. And I'm trying to get my cursor over there so I can show you. Anyway, this all this is solid black during the breeding season. But these obviously are taken on the same day and they are both adults. And I can tell you because although these feathers are edged in white, they're all different colors and all different types, which means that this is a breeding adult molting into its winter or what we call alternate plumage. So the alternate, uh, excuse me, excuse me, alternate plumage is breeding, basic plumage is the wintering plumage. So basic plumage is what they're molting into. And this is a picture of a juvenile. So this bird hatched out somewhere far north. And we know this is a juvenile because all of its feathers are pretty much uniform. It has no evidence of having a black belly. And all these feathers are about the same length and shape and so on. If this were a better picture, you would see how clean all those feathers are. So that's how we know that this was a juvenile bird and not an adult. So birds also vary with age. So we need to take that into consideration when we're looking at birds um, for identification purposes. And 
lighting plays a really big role in how we see a bird. I took this picture, these pictures in my backyard. Um, I'm trying to think if this was spring migration or fall migration. I believe this was fall migration this past year. We did a lot of backyard birding this year. And I can't be sure, honestly, that I didn't have two Swainson's thrushes in my yard, but I only saw this one bird. And if you look at this bird here on the left, this bird was in the shade. And Swainson's thrush or thrushes in particular like the understory. They like to be thick in the habitat and they're um, foraging for insects or other invertebrates in the ground. And if you notice one, hint that we have that they eat insects and that they like the understory is this large eye that they have. Compared to the head size, this bird has a very large eye. And that tells us that this bird likes the understory and forages often or perhaps spends most of its time in the dark or within the thicket. So that tells us a lot about this bird. But look at the difference in coloration from this bird on the left. And then just moments later, a bird came out into my bird bath. And look at the rustiness that this bird has. This bird is pretty much uniformly rusty colored. And that's how we know that this is a Swainson's thrush. But it looks completely different to me than this bird on the left. I know this is still a Swainson's thrush because if it were a hermit thrush, it would have other field marks that I'm just not seeing on this bird. There are two subspecies of Swainson's thrush. So I'm still not convinced that this wasn't a second individual, but lighting certainly plays a role on what we can see on a bird. And that's where having nice optics helps too, because oftentimes, you may not even see a bird that's under the bush or in the shade well, because your optics just aren't there. Um, so <laughs> this is another example of how birds vary with light. And we'd certainly love to always have the opportunity to see a bird well hovering over a bush. But this actually has a whole different reason why this bird is varying with light and that is these beautiful gorget feathers and many of the feathers on hummingbirds. I don't know, I'm sure many of you know, but those feathers are actually structural. So the way this the feather is built, if you will, allows like a prism that you remember from art class, it allows the light to refract at a certain wavelength off of that feather. So depending on how that hummingbird is holding its head will depend on the amount of light that's refracting off of that feather and allowing it to illuminate in that particular spectrum of light. So this is an Anna's hummingbird and she, or well, this is a he, has um, a hot pink gorget. And so those feathers are refracting that light to show us that hot pink color because of the structure of the feather. It doesn't have anything to do with pigments like on other birds. For example, this bird, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you know the house finch. And I'll tell you later why this is a house finch for those of you that may not know. But the house finch, has these beautiful red feathers on the male. And these beautiful red feathers actually have to do with diet. So the carotenoids that it gets from the food that it eats allow it to have these beautiful bright red feathers. But when there's something lacking in the diet, it may have this yellow appearance like the one on the right. This is still a male house finch, but for whatever reason, 
the diet is different. And so those carotenoids that bring out the red color in its plumage are not there. And so it gets this mustardy yellow color. So birds have different types of feathers that create different ways that we see color in them. Something else that we need to keep in mind when trying to identify birds is that when birds get wet, they may be very difficult to even recognize or identify. And this is kind of an extreme photo, but I thought it was super cute, so I had to add it. But if you look at this bird, it's completely drenched. And I know Andrea knows what this is, <laughs> but um, I put this as a quiz on Instagram. Um, but birds will change with the fact that they're wet. And you know, if you're out birding and you don't see the bath, and all of a sudden you see a bird in a bush, hopefully it won't be this messed up, but it may look damp and you may not recognize it right away. Hey, wait a minute, that bird is damp. It may have just had a bath. That is going to affect your ability to recognize that bird or be able to perhaps identify that bird to species because it may be wet or somehow affected by the environment. And this is a perfect example of that. This is a bush tit. And although these feathers are quite worn, look how worn these feathers are. Their edges are so messed up. This bird actually must have been feeding on some nectar or something sticky on its face. And it actually probably rubbed against a bush to get the sticky off and also took off many of its feathers. So um, I'm seeing three people in the chat. Is that, um, oh, what was the wet bird? Someone's asking. <laughs> the wet bird, actually, I'll go back because it's kind of neat. We can identify this bird by um, the bill color mostly. This bill color is an orangey color. And if we look at the picture on the left, it's got a somewhat long tail. And I, for those who don't really know birds, um, this is a sparrow. And this is actually a white crowned sparrow. And we'll go over that later why that's a white crowned sparrow, but that's a white crowned sparrow. Anyway, there's environmental factors that may affect our ability to identify birds. And I couldn't find the photo readily, but I have a photograph of a yellow rumped warbler that similarly is missing feathers from its face. And if you notice, that makes that bill look very large and it makes the face shape different. And this yellow rump warbler looked very different. And I had some folks send me that picture asking me what that bird was because they thought they knew, but those environmental factors um, have changed the appearance of that bird. And let's face it, if you're seeing a bird in a bush and you're trying to identify it and you're getting glimpses, those things may truly affect what your ideas are about that bird. And here's a closer picture of that sticky sap or nectar or whatever that this bush tit must have rubbed those feathers right off. There's also genetic issues with birds. Um, this is what we call dilute plumage. So this is a female mallard and we can tell that by the bill color and some of the facial markings and of course the orange legs help out quite a bit and I'll tell you about this later but the speculum helps but this plumage is not the right color this is a very whitish but it's still tan so there's still some melanin in the the plumage here but we call this dilute plumage so for whatever genetic reason this bird has lost the ability to express all of its melanin and so it's diluted in color. And this is um, a similar bird in the bird bath, but this bird is actually missing some areas um, where those feathers have come in white and other areas are fine. So this is what we call 
albinism or leukistic plumage. So partially leukistic means that some of the feathers have a genetic um, interruption, let's say, to express the genes properly in those particular feathers. It's not the whole entire um, bird, but just some of the feathers. And then there's things like <laughs> genetic diversity. Um, we actually call these funny ducks. And these are, uh, mallards are actually part of a complex um, because for centuries, um, mallards have been interbred as domesticated animals. And oftentimes breeders will pick particular traits that they like to see in their waterfowl. And so they um, breed for those particular traits. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I, at our parks, we often see a lot of what we call funny ducks. Um, these birds have interbred with other birds and they are not entirely uh, pure anything. Well, there are a mallard, but it's kind of like this big umbrella of traits. And um, I think personally that perhaps some homeschool folks are trying to get their kids to learn the life cycle of an egg and they order eggs online. And then once they get to be um, hatched and they go through the life cycle, they dump, dump the adults or big chicks at the park. And that's how we get some of these larger ducks. But you can see characteristics of ballards like this one here, but they're all different. And so those are all traits um, that we need to think of when we're looking at a duck because they might not be this obvious. And one of the birds that they potentially are breeding with are these kind of um, domesticated. These are kind of a, a, ge a goose, but they can interbreed with those mallards. And here is that type of um, funny duck. And this shows just the size difference when it's breeding with that other um, domesticated animal. So how are we gonna figure this out? <laughs> There's a lot of variation. Um, I'm noticing more stuff in the chat. So let me see what people are asking. <laughs> yeah, someone says they call them a gang of bullies. They are very aggressive, that's for sure. Um, they can be because the, the, some of those geese are very aggressive. It's unfortunate that we have folks that are feeding um, wildlife like this. I've even at that park seen people feeding the um, peacocks and the ravens cat food. And it's just so, so, so bad to feed wildlife. So I hope you guys will tell your friends or whoever you see, please try to educate them what a detriment it is to wildlife to feed wildlife. Not only is it making them food reliant, but it also um, makes them more susceptible to predation. And it's just all around not good. I, I almost threw some photos in here of birds that were so swollen from eating the wrong nutrition that they were up on the bank and they would die. They I didn't see them, but I'm sure they would eventually die from the amount of food they had in their system. Anyway, I know you guys were trained with Joel in the fall last year, and he went over many different silhouette types to help people understand the silhouettes of birds. Um, but we're going to take it a little bit further. And it's not enough to just understand this is the head and these are the wings and this is the tail. We actually need to know the various parts of a bird so that we can um, describe that to someone else and to separate some of these species because some of these species have very, very similar markings and we'll get into that as well. Anyway, there's lots of field guides. I personally um, uh, grew up on, if you will, 
Na National Geographic. And I always recommend that you have um, a field guide that covers all of North America, because we do in, especially here in Southern California, we do see birds that really should only occur um, on the East Coast um, or even uh, the Aleutians. We've had birds come um, fly, migrate the wrong way. So having a Western guide doesn't really help you because if you're looking at a bird that occurs in the East and all you have is a Western guide, you aren't gonna find the bird you're looking for. So I highly recommend a Western, or a, excuse me, a, a full national guide. And I recommend personally um, National Geographic. That's the one I uh, was raised on. And that's the one I, I obviously have many other guides, <laughs> but I prefer that one myself. Um, one of the reasons is this bird here, this um, showed up in my backyard in the fall. This is a Virginia's warbler. And this is a bird that belongs in the East Coast. But one day I was birding my backyard and here's this Virginia's warbler in my bird bed. So um, I wouldn't have been able to identify it. Well, of course I've read the book, <laughs> but I wouldn't have been able to identify it if I'd had only a Western guide, it wouldn't have um, been in the guide. And you can always uh, bone up on extra guides as well. Um, have specifics like warblers, hawks, hummingbirds, sparrows, all kinds of things. <clears throat> I'm seeing more chat, so I'm going to take a look. Um, someone saying they feed birds at their house. Um, I kind of agree and don't agree with that. Um, we do have feeders in our yard, but they are not um, entirely all year. And um, we make sure that we keep them absolutely clean, which has been a recent problem with, um, there's been an eruption year of pine siskins this year. That's a montane species that usually doesn't come this low uh, into the um, coastal zone or into the lowlands. Um, in the winter, it usually stays somewhat elevated. And um, this year there's been quite an eruption of pine siskin. But if you go on to my Instagram or on um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, they have put out um, a bulletin about the fact that we've lost thousands of birds this year to salmonella. Um, there's some spread of uh, the disease and they suspect that it's where birds are congregating, which means feeders. So we have to be very careful when we feed birds and we have to be responsible that we're doing the best thing for those birds. Um, we need to know that we're not being impactful or I, I know there's people that have live mealworms and, and they have fly catchers or other birds that they are ha practically hand feeding. But when you do things like that, you're making that bird reliant on you. You're, training their children to be reliant on you and you're making them less aware or less um, concerned about predation and they will be susceptible to hawks um, if they're more concerned about where are you where's my mealworms than they are about where's the cooper's hawk right so we have to be responsible um so there's books on coloration mold um all different kinds of other uh, guides that you can broaden your understanding of birds. But let's say you want to go out birding some early morning and you need to know what you're looking at. So this is the part where I really kind of want and hope that we'll um, get delve into understanding. So I hope you guys have some sort of a field guide. I um, have my Nat Geo right here. They're on the seventh edition, by the way. So there's nothing wrong with buying an older edition. This is um, the plates and, and diagrams in this book are the most up to date. There's also an organization called, um, well, it used to be called the AOU, the um, American Ornithological Union. 
now it's called the AOS Society. So they determine through DNA testing and other research how these birds are related to each other. And the books, these field guides, um, put the, book, the birds in order dictated by them as to how they're related to each other. And in the front of your book, do you guys have your field guides? I hope you'll get out a field guide. If you look in the front of your field guide, see if you don't have pages like the one I have up on my screen that show how we identify these birds. Do you guys have such a thing? Okay, um, I hope you do. I'm gonna ask you guys to do me a big favor and if you would please um, chat about um, some of the things that we're talking about and not so much back and forth about, I saw this at the park or I didn't. I'd love to um, be able to answer questions and I hope that we have a lot to cover. So I don't wanna keep being distracted and be able to um, answer questions about what you guys are um, asking. Well, so it depends. Someone's asking what page I'm on. It depends on the field guide that you have, but all field guides, most all field guides will have in the front of the book something like this. I have Nat Geo 7th edition. It's on page 10. I'm not going to ask you to follow along because I know not everybody's going to have the same exact field guide. And I do have upcoming diagrams, but I do um, want us to talk about these terms that help us to identify birds. So I, I didn't want to get super hardcore and that's why I went through the whole cartoon thing. But um, it is important that we all speak the same language and you know, it's funny, I, when I was in school and I got my degree in biology, I had a fantastic entomology professor and we went to Costa Rica, a bunch of us um, for a class. And one afternoon she and I were sitting and looking at birds and in, if you know creepers, they have like 20 different creepers in Costa Rica. And they are these little brown birds that, well, actually some of theirs are very large and they all look very much the same. They have all these little brown streaks and you're supposed to be able to figure out which is which. <laughs> so I sat with the binoculars and was calling out field marks and she had the field guide and she's like, gee, Bettina, I sure wish I spoke the same language as you because I have no idea what you're saying. So we weren't able to identify that creeper because she just didn't know what I was talking about when I was talking about these field marks. So that is what we're gonna change. Uh, so Bettina, we do have one yep. hand raised. Um, so Peter sure, Brown, please. Uh, would like to ask a sure, question. Sure, Peter, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, I can now. Thank you. Okay. Um, it, it's not related to where you were, but I had a question in general. And, and that is please. Um, up in Canada, they've seen a huge decline in one category of birds, which is aerial insectivores and related to the huge decline in insects because of the overuse of neonicotinoids. Um, <clears throat> do you know whether that is also being seen south of the border? You know, I don't know of any absolute studies on that matter. I, I, I'm sure you notice it um, when you're in the field as well because I love insects too. I'm seeing quite a, uh, quite a decline in insects as well. Um, when I travel, like I've been just this past year, um, I've been to Joshua Tree and San Jacinto a couple of times. I've tried to um, stay home, of course, because of the pandemic. Um, but one of the ways that they started doing research, I'm sure you know, and maybe some of the other folks know, they started looking at insect populations is because a scientist in the UK noticed that when he would travel a couple of hundred miles, let's say to go see a bird or do whatever, 
he wasn't seeing as many insects on his windshield and the, the radiator of his car. And so he thought, wow, when we, when we were kids, our car was coated and we'd have to stop and wash our windshield. And now we're not having to do that. And we've just driven two or 300 miles. So um, anecdotally, I can say, yes, I don't see as many bumblebees. In fact, I don't see as many native bees, even in the wild, where if I go birding somewhere like in the foothills or somewhere away from what you would expect, um, uh, you know, more urbanized habitat. I don't see as many native bees and I do see a ton of honeybees. So I'm wondering how much all of our concern for the honeybee is pushing out our natives in wild areas as well. But um, I don't know of specific studies that they have determined um, the direct correlation with loss of birds and insects. Of course, there were many reports last February, not maybe it was even the February before the pandemic. No, I think it was the year of the pandemic, um, right before it hit. Um, there were many studies that come out, came out talking about the insect apocalypse and the decline in birds and that we've lost 3 billion birds since the 1970s. And like you say, Peter, much of that is um, due to loss of insects. and. It, it terrifies me. <laughs> you, I haven't talked about that in, yet in this lecture because this was um, about field identification, but I've given lectures most recently, um, I guess it was last month um, to see and Sage, I was the speaker for the general meeting last month and talked about uh, insects. And my one of my main concerns uh, that I let people know about was the loss of insects that is certainly impacting flycatchers, if not other species, because many of these birds um, rely on the extra fat um, at different parts of the year. So I don't know if that answered your question, but um, personally, I think I'm seeing a difference from when I first started birding and now in abundance of many different types of birds. Um, and things are changing. And I actually have some other things to talk about later on about climate change that I think is affecting some of these bird species that we're seeing. Anyway. I'll, I'll, I'll send you the, the um, link to the Canadian report on the decline Please do. of specifically aerial yeah. insectivores. Okay. Yeah, I'd Thank love to see it. I, I like, yeah, like I said, I personally um, am, that's one of my biggest, biggest things. I've, I've recently lectured on insect loss. In fact, it's terrifying. My, both of my neighbors on either side have Orkin or some other pest control company come and spray randomly around their house and it freaks me out. I'm out in the front yard with my macro lens photographing insects on my native plants and my neighbors are killing everything in sight. Oh, anyway, that's another night. We'll do that another time. You and I, we can co-lecture about it. Okay. Anyway, good so, deal. Yeah, well, I'd love to. I'd love to. Okay, I'm seeing more chatting. So let me go up here and see um, if I can find my cursor. Sorry, you guys, I've got two screens and it's kind of hard to move my cursor. Uh, did we lose 3 billion species of birds since the 1970s? Not species. We've lost 3 billion individual birds. They predict, uh, they suspect since the 1970s. So they've done a lot of research on, um, they've used m several different, um, uh, how do I say, scientific resources, one of which was Doppler radar even. And they've um, done many studies. You can, you can look at insect, insect apocalypse or um, three billion birds lost, or you can do some Google searching and find the papers um, where they've talked about the loss um, we've had of insects and birds since the 1970s. And they say that since 1970, we've lost 3 billion individual birds, not necessarily 3 billion species. We haven't wiped out a bunch of species. But actually, on that note, um, they're predicting with climate change, we stand to lose um, 397 species. Uh, in North America alone, 
if we don't get climate change under control. So that's not even species that are necessarily on the endangered species list. That may be species that, I mean, we are losing individuals like starlings and house finches. House finches are moving their home range because of climate change. And we're seeing those things. I also am seeing those things in the research that I do and the 30 years that I've been birding, I can see the difference. Like some of these birds are occurring more frequently. Some of these birds we're hardly ever seeing. We used to get quite a few rare birds every winter. We're seeing fewer and fewer rare birds. And I just think they aren't surviving the trip anymore. They used to make it from the east to the west, but I don't think they're able to survive because of lots of things. Look at this, look at the whole country is in a deep freeze right now, right? I watched the news the other day, like ice all the way down to Texas, right? So how is a little teeny warbler gonna survive that? I don't know. Um, I hope that's, let's see, my house witches are being predated by non-native Easter squirrel. Well, hey, you know, Tell your, this person saying that Eastern fox squirrel is predating their house finches. Well, tell your neighbors, stop feeding the freaking house, the, the, the Eastern fox squirrels. They're not native. They don't belong here. Everybody thinks it's so cute to have a squirrel in their backyard. Well, that upsets the balance, right? It's non-native. It doesn't belong. Okay, so someone's put in some, go look at some, um, someone's being, putting some links in the chat. So go look at those links. Um, Birds Cornell has some certainly uh, information. Oh, that reminds me before I forget, someone's put Backyard Cornell EDU. This weekend is the great backyard bird count. So I hope you guys are doing some backyard bird birding. Sea and Sage has definitely been promoting in the last year backyard birding challenges because of the pandemic. So we're encouraging people to stay home, stay safe and bird their backyard, which I'll tell you in the fall migration, I had, I, in a month I had 86 different species occur in my backyard. It was fantastic. Anyway, you can go to birdcount.org, you know, www, all that, birdcount.org and find out about the great American backyard bird count. They do it every year. And um, I was supposed to remember to say that. So check it out. We're gonna do some backyard birding, put in some eBird lists and see if we can't um, submit some data that will help us understand many of these questions. Uh, Follow-up email to, okay, yeah, please do send a follow-up to everyone. Okay, so back to this whole field mark thing. <laughs> this picture on the screen um, shows, and now I probably should get rid of my chat window. Um, the terminology that we use to help identify a bird in the field, no matter what the species, um, this happens to be a sparrow, but these birds, well, all birds have very much the same feather tracks. So the way that the feathers are growing in the skin is the same on most every bird, there's some exceptions, um, actually depending on you know, the type of bird, there's some exceptions as well, but, but these birds' feathers are growing in, in the same tracks as another bird. So we use these um, terms to describe the areas of a bird so that we can understand where those color variations may occur. Now, having said that, if the bird is all green, guess what? It still has these same feather tracks, but all those feathers happen to be green. So <laughs> we have to find other field marks to separate that green bird from that green bird. But many birds will um, show these same feather tracks and and in different colors. So that helps us separate them. Uh, so Peter's asking me what I'm doing to draw birds to my backyard. I had to remove all my feeders to keep the 16 rock pigeons from living on my roof. You know, the best way to 
attract birds to your yard is by having a water feature because all birds, all life, let's face it, requires water and um, sometimes a cocktail. So <laughs> if you have a water feature in your yard and especially a dripping water feature. So if you even, even if you were to take a terracotta um, pot base, a plant base, and um, fill it with some water and take a gallon jug and tie a rope around a branch and poke a hole in that jug, that dripping sound of water into that terracotta planter at the bottom is going to attract birds to that dripping water sound. And they're gonna hear that in migration or otherwise, and they're gonna say, oh my God, water, it's life. And they're gonna come, especially in the early morning or late afternoon. So like if you wanted to do it periodically, if you didn't wanna install a whole big water feature, you could hang that jug you know, in the early morning or say four o'clock, in the afternoon and you could sit out in the backyard and you could watch the birds come into that bath to not only take a bath but to drink water and if birds are in migration and they see green especially natives they're going to go oh my god natives life and they're going to come to your yard because you have native insects you have water water means life and they're going to see the plants are green so they're gonna to come to your yard, but they do hear that dripping water in migration and they will come to your yard. I, like I said, I had 86 species in a month. I birded every day and some days I only birded half an hour, but I was out there. I have a water feature. Um, I do feed the birds a little bit, but it's mostly that they're coming in to take a bath or drink water. In fact, I had a las bunting, a, a young las bunting come. It was in the tree and it was afraid and it didn't want to come down. It came down twice, just like that, got some water and I never saw it again. But I got a couple shots and I saw that it was a Las Bunty, but it just came for water and was gone. So anyway, water is the best way to attract wildlife to your yard of all kinds. So I'd like to go over this chart with you guys. And if you guys have a buck, I don't know how many of us are still here, but if you have a book and you have um, a front section, um, some of the authors treat these marks a little bit differently. But if you go to the front of your book, you should have some sort of um, diagrams for the head and the wing and the body. So we're gonna take them all separately. But this is how we look at a bird. We, um, if, if all, is fabulous um, if it's always presenting itself the way we hope it will. Um, we can see the bird um, from bill to tail. But if we can't, we work with what we have and that's when we get out our notebook. So obviously um, we have a bill and um, we have an upper mandible and a lower mandible and on some birds, those are different colors, they're not the same. So knowing that we have an upper mandible and a lower mandible is important. The chin of a bird is actually just below the mandibles and starts going onto the throat. So if it's just below the mandibles, we call that the chin. Don't look at my three chins. Um, but it, it eventually becomes the throat and the throat is just basically around the neck. And I do have a bird photo standing by, so I'll show you exactly what that means. Um, <clears throat> the eye area is very important. So right here, can you guys see my cursor? I hope thumbs up, Heather, yeah, cool. So between the eye and the bill, we call this area the lores, lores. So just between the eye and the bill, we have the laurel area or lores. And this diagram doesn't show it, um, but just above that right here, 
we call that the supra laurel. So supra means above. So supra laurel means above the lores. So on some birds, we are concerned with what their lore color is or the lores. And on some birds, we need to see a supra laurel spot. And I have an example of that as well. Um, an eye ring on a bird usually is um, skin, but can be just a faint row of tiny little feathers that are attached to that skin that create an eye ring on a bird. So some birds have an eye ring of a different color. And so knowing that we have an eye ring of a different color for some species might be important. This whole stripe from the supra laurel area, starting at the base of the bill, uh, the upper mandible, and working your way back to the nape or the back of the head, this whole area back here is called the nape. That area is called the supercilium. And many birds have a stripe there above their eye and we call that a supercilium. So if a bird has a supercilium, we know, you know, that's important to, as a field mark for some birds. So that's a very, very good question. Someone just asked me, what's the difference between the eye ring and the orbital ring? And actually that person is, is right in suggesting um, that I answer that because the orbital ring actually is the skin and the eye ring is actually a ring of feathers. So the orbital ring may just be that bare skin of a different color. Um, remind me when we get to killdeer to show you that a killdeer has an orange orbital ring um, but some birds also have feathers on that um, uh, eye ring. So once we are um, concerned with the supercilium, we then have these stripes along here and this particular diagram shows multiple stripes, but these stripes are all called the median, uh, excuse me, the lateral, crown stripes. And this particular diagram doesn't show that, but lateral needs sides. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the sides of the crown. The sides of the crown have stripes. And so those are called lateral crown stripes because they're on either side of the crown. And this bird has, it looks like three lateral crown stripes. So this whole area is the crown, the crown of the head. And <clears throat> on the crown of the head, we have on this particular bird or some other species, a median crown stripe. So median means middle. So the median crown stripe is that stripe that would occur right in the center of the bird's crown. So the median crown stripe. Okay. Now, some, bird, uh, some books call it an eye line. We um, often refer to it as an eye stripe, um, but sometimes the eye stripe goes through the lores and behind the eye, and it's still an eye stripe. A, we would call that a complete eye stripe when it goes from the base of the bill all the way through to the end this is calling it an eye line. So the ears of a bird are located underneath this group of feathers here. So underneath this patch of feathers on the side of the face is called the auricular because the ear is actually located underneath all those feathers. So we call that auricular patch, auriculars, um, because the ear is underneath that patch of feathers. Now on some birds, there's a line all the way around it. On other birds, there isn't. 
sometimes that those feathers are a different color absent of lines, but it depends on the individual species. So we can get to that. Another question. Yes, um, sometimes they do refer to it as ear coverts and not just um, an auricular area or, or auricular patch. So there are different terminology used um, in different books on how that's referred to. But the, the main thing is that because the auricular or ear is located underneath those feathers, um, it's often called an auricular patch or auricular coverts. So the back of the head and neck um, is called the nape. So right back here. And some birds have a completely different colored nape and even comes back onto the throat and sides of the head. And some may just have, um, you know, coloration that perhaps goes from the head all the way through the nape down to the back. So the nape is this area here. Some birds it extends through, the, the coloration extends through, but the nape is referring to the back of the head basically. So the other facial marks that are super important are this um, submustachial. Um, the, there's three, some are calling this a subauricular some are calling it auricular. This is a submustachial. And then uh, as it adjoins the lower mandible, it could be considered a mustachial or a malar stripe. And again, some field guides are referring to it a little bit differently. I prefer to use the terminology from Nat Geo because it's a little more distinctive. And I know Sibley um, mentions it a little bit differently. So did I cover everything? I'm trying to see, let's see. Eye line, supercilium crown, median crown, eye ring. Looks like I've pretty much covered all those stripes. So let's look at a bird now and see if we can't figure out some of these stripes. So this is a song sparrow. And on this song sparrow, I'm trying to see if we have uh, people still here. Have we got people still here? Or are we just uh, a few of us? Oh, there's some of us here. We, okay. We've still got almost 50 people, Bettina. Oh, fantastic. I keep seeing it change and all of a sudden I'm not seeing anyone. I'm seeing just black. So <laughs> am I talking to myself? <laughs> I think it's fascinating. So, <laughs> so bear with me. On this song sparrow, um, we have, oh, I've got my cursor on the wrong, wrong screen. You want it over there. Okay. So here we have that um, lateral crown stripe, right, on the song sparrow. And if you look closely, there's kind of a hint of a grayish median crown stripe, right? So that stripe is just a little bit different colored than this lateral crown stripe. And then here we have our supercilium and on this bird, it's quite wide. On some birds, it's not quite so wide. And if we had a, um, a, a different coloration um, up in, oh, where did my cursor go? There it is. Up here, it would actually be the supra laurel, right? Because that's above the lores, which are right here on this bird. And as um, Brenda pointed out, the skin of this bird's eye ring is right here. But these are those eye ring feathers that I talked about. I don't know if you can see how tiny those little feathers are, but there's just a line of feathers that are in that skin of this bird and that's what we would call an eye ring. Now, obviously on this bird, the eye ring is not a huge feel mark, but on some birds, it's very important to notice whether it has an eye ring or not. Um, this is that eye line that they talked about. This we would call because it doesn't really extend into the lores. 
we would call this a postocular. Oops, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. We would call this a postocular eye line or eye stripe. If it went all the way through to the bill, it would be an eye stripe. But because it's behind the eye, ocular, postocular eye line or stripe. And this is kind of difficult on this bird because it's not quite um, as obvious as some others. But this is the auricular patch. And you can kind of see that this is a little bit of a different color than the other feathers on the nape or on the cheeks, could be that whole area. And here's that um, line that they called a subocular stripe. This is perhaps the sub mustachial. And on this bird, it's kind of hard to see that it connects, but this is the malar or um, sub mustachial. And this is quite wide at the, at the uh, tip over here. The base is narrow, but when it gets out here, it kind of flares out into quite a big thing here. So on a song sparrow, this um, malar or sub uh, mustachial, or mustachial, excuse me, mustachial stripe is quite strong. This is the chin right underneath the mandible. And this would be kind of like, like a breast um, patch, if you will. It depends on the way the bird is standing, how much that's obvious. So nape, this kind of uh, goes around to the nape, right? Upper mandible, lower mandible. Any questions on any of that stuff? I see there's something in the chat. Uh, ear covered to so someone saying it's your view. I'm not sure what they mean by that, but I guess it depends on um, the view um, and, and the author you're choosing to follow. I think that's maybe what they mean. I'm not sure. But here's what I was talking about, the supralaurel. So this is the supralaurel spot, which is super important for this species in particular. This would be the lores between the eye and the upper mandible, which is black. But this is a black-throated gray warbler. And on this particular species, because it's often confused with a black and white warbler, as you can see, this bird is pretty much black and white and gray. If it's flitting around in a tree, you absolutely want to look for this supralaurel spot that's yellow to confirm your ID. Because if you don't see that, it could be a black and white warbler. So on this particular bird, that supralaurel spot is very important. This is a female because it's got a white throat. Uh, a male would have black and it's got a little bit of a necklace here. Um, I'm not sure. Someone's asking, is the malar also known as whiskers? I'm not sure. I've never heard it referred to as that. Um, Flycatchers, which we'll get to, um, do have a um, a um, what we call brick bri brictal feathers that um, are out um, from its bill, and those feathers are um, stiff and therefore um, might be referred to as whiskers. And I'm just looking at the time. We have spent a lot of time on this and gotten nowhere. I shouldn't be answering all these questions in the chat perhaps. Uh, it's noted in Falcon Guide. Yeah, I'm not terribly familiar with, um, maybe they mean the mustachial instead of whiskers. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that guide. So it looks like I better um, forge ahead though, because I've gotten very few slides off and um, have a lot more to talk about. Anyway, so this is the entire bird. 
And we've just gone over the facial features. And here again is the nape, which can extend all the way around the face. This is what we call the mantle. And that's the back or the upper back. And oftentimes we refer to the mantle when we're talking about gulls. So when we talk about the coloration of a gull, we're talking oftentimes about the coloration of the mantle on the gull. The scapulars are feathers that are adjacent to the wing. And actually some birds have quite extreme uh, scapulars, but um, some are not very um, conspicuous at all. And then when we're talking about the wing, we have coverts that actually these coverts are covering the shaft of the primary and secondary feathers that are coming out the main feathers that support the flight of the bird. And so from here at the um, base of the body out, these are called secondaries. And then we have what we call the flight feathers or the primary feathers. And each bird has the same, most every bird, I should say, has the same number of primary feathers as they do secondary feathers. And as you can see, the shape of the feathers a little bit different and those promote the flight of the bird. But we have um, on those primaries, what, what we call greater primary coverts. So these are fine little feathers that cover the shafts of the feathers that are coming out of the skin of the bird to protect those shafts and those primaries from environmental damage. There's a little group of feathers, three, I think, um, called the alula, and those just kind of cover those um, primaries. But then we have these coverts, which are called the greater coverts. And these covert feathers are covering the secondaries. And we have the median coverts, which are covering the greater coverts. And then we have the lesser coverts. And the lesser coverts can be quite a few feathers, but they're covering the median and greater coverts. So it's like a stair step of feathers that are protecting that wing from damage when the bird's in flight. Um, at the base of the body, we have typically three feathers called the tertials. And this is more prominent on some species than others, but we have these three tertial feathers that cover um, the secondaries when they fold into the, the body, when the wing is folded. And those tertials on some species are very important to know um, and help to identify a bird based on the coloration or um, the, the, the feather edging of those tertial feathers. So that's kind of important on specific birds. Um, then we have these rump feathers. Um, many of you know the house finch has like a reddish rump. So those are the rump feathers. And then we have what we call the upper tail coverts. And much like these wing coverts, this row of feathers is the upper tail coverts and it's covering the shafts of the tail feathers. And um, those tail feathers, uh, I always get this mixed up. The wing feathers are rectrices and the tail feathers are remiges, or I've got it backwards. I'll have to look it up. Anyway, someone can look it up for me. <clears throat> so the tail feathers and the wing feathers have names as well. Um, on the open wing, uh, on the underside, we still have primaries, we have secondaries, and you can see there's a, quite a distinctive split where those are. And then we still have under wing coverts. So these under wing coverts might be a different color than the wing feathers or even than the upper wing coverts. Um, when the bird's in flight, we want to see the sides of the bird. When we go to the rear of the bird, we call those the flanks. The breast is the majority of the front of the bird. Um, the belly, of course, is below the breast. 
And then we may have, um, that's kind of funny. They're calling that undertail coverts, but that's pretty, undertail coverts would be this actually. Oh, I see. This is the, oh, that's what they're calling the vent is here where of course the um, bird evacuates. And then the undertail coverts are protecting the tail feathers. And if you notice the outermost tail feathers are what is folding into the inside of the tail. So when that bird folds its tail, we're actually seeing from underneath the outermost tail feathers. So that's how oftentimes a bird's color um, seems different from the upper to the lower is because we're seeing the other side of the tail feathers. So here's a great blue heron. And I thought this really shows the different feather tracks on this wing pretty well. So here's our secondaries and you can see the cutoff here. It's pretty distinctive. These are the secondary feathers. And then these are the, oops, sorry, sorry. These are the, primary feathers. And it looks like this bird actually has some recent molt because some of these feathers seem newer. See how black these feathers are in comparison to this feather and this feather and these. So these feathers are newer, this feather too, than these feathers here. Okay, so rectrices are the tail feathers and remages are the primaries and secondaries. I'm sorry if I didn't say that right, but I think I did, I don't know. Um, okay, so someone else is talking about a lecture they attended that um, referred to whiskers. And I know that's a very famous author, but um, I'm not sure why that he would call things whis whiskers and not follow the standard of um, others have set. Anyway, um, I met him, he's a very nice guy. He said I was a beautiful birder and signed my book. <laughs> um, so these are this, the primary flight feathers. And then these are the greater coverts. So these feathers are covering the primaries. And these are the median primary coverts. And then these are the secondary coverts. These are the greater secondary coverts. These are the median secondary coverts. And then most all of these up here are what we call lesser coverts. So all these feathers are protecting the shafts of these wing feathers going in. And these are all really important. And I guess I don't know that I put a picture there, but these are important because on some birds, these feathers actually become wing bars for us. So the tips of some of these feathers actually have either pale feather edges or the feathers themselves are a different color. And so on the folded wing, it becomes a wing bar. And if it becomes a wing bar, that becomes an additional field mark for us to be able to identify that bird. So the reason we're taking this painstaking time to go through these things is because these are ways of identifying birds based on these feather tracks. So this kind of gives you the same idea. I'm not gonna go over it again, but here are your rectrices. And we count these feathers from the inner body outward. So as you can see, the first primary is here out to the ninth primary. And that same occurs with the secondaries and then the tail feathers. So on a bird, we have a left side of the tail and a right side of the tail. And we start counting from the two center tail feathers outward. So these are rectrice one, two, three, four, five, six. And those things can be important depending on what we're looking at. And here again, are these three tertial feathers, the innermost web of the wing against the body, these three tertials might be very important and they kind of are separated from the secondaries, but they're kind of a continuation of the secondaries. So this is a red-tailed hawk and 
one of the ways we know this is a red-tailed hawk is these black or dark, what we call patagial bands on the forewing of this bird. And you can see right here where those secondary feathers and these primary feathers, and when it's uh, exposed like this, we often call those fingers. Um, these primary and secondary feathers occur on this red-tailed hawk. And all these feathers underneath here of different colors, those are referred to as underwing coverts when we're talking about the whole section. And on some birds, the underwing coverts are a completely different color than the wing itself. And so we refer to that differently. These are your under tail coverts. And then of course your tail feathers or rectrices. Uh oh, wrong thing. So this is um, a white crowned sparrow and this has our upper and lower mandible and it actually has a dark tip. It has a pale lores and a black eye stripe, a supercilium in gray. And then these are the lateral crown stripes with a white median crown stripe. The nape is gray, but we can see many of those feathers that we talked about. And here's those three tertials, right? And do you see how the edges of those tertials are different than even on the folded wing of this um, bird? Here is the edges of those greater coverts and median coverts that are edged in white. And those white edges make those um, have wing bars. So if a, if a bird has wing bars, it's because those coverts are edged in a different color. And it's not important on this particular species, but some species it's very important to understand the um, end of the secondary feathers, which actually seem to be up here, and where the primary feathers are extending beyond the secondaries, we call that the primary projection. And um, it's not as important on this particular bird, but on some birds, it's very important. Here again, shows the greater coverts, the median coverts, and the lesser coverts on this extended wing. And the secondaries, I'm not sure they maybe end here, and the primaries. Here's your tail feathers, your upper tail coverts, and your rump. So that actually is a yellow crowned night heron, but when I got that shot, I thought, oh, perfect. <laughs> I'm not gonna go into great detail on this because it basically talks about the same thing. So there is your um, bird once again. There's probably a few more terms you can find uh, in, your, in your book. Here again, primaries, coverts, greater coverts, and then all these other coverts on this beautiful morning dove. This is a uh, Lincoln Sparrow. And again, you can see greater, uh, excuse me, uh, secondaries and primaries. Primaries usually fold underneath the secondaries, so you don't even always see the primaries unless they're extended beyond the secondaries. Greater coverts, lesser coverts, and uh, so on, or median coverts, and so on. Here's a perfect example of that gray nape that actually kind of comes around the auriculars and shows all gray for the most part on this Lincoln Sparrow. And that's a closer view of that. And here again, here's the rump on this pigeon. And those feathers there, although some are kind of messed up, it looks like. Those are your um, tail coverts or uh, upper tail coverts, and this is the rump. And then up here would be considered the mantle or the back. And then of course, the outermost tail feather will fold underneath and we won't see it. And these are the, the uppermost central feathers that you're going to see on the bird. One of the important things on shorebirds is that we measure the bill length based on the head length ratio. And so if you have one head length, then this bird has two and a half, its bill length is two and a half head lengths. And you'll find that referred to in your guides. 
So we all want to go out birding and see beautiful birds. And we always hope that it turns out like that. But sometimes it turns out like this. <laughs> and sometimes you're looking into a bush and you're hoping to actually see something. Um, that shorebird uh, was a marbled godwit. So if you look closely, and hopefully with binoculars, you can actually see a bill shape here and the start of a face. You can see belly color. You can see a wing. You can see some undertail coverts and you can actually see some tail behind some of those feathers. So not to be discouraged and hope that the bird sticks around, but if you can see all that, you can make a note of it. So I always encourage everyone, including myself, I do still, I don't always take a notebook, but I always have a blank piece of paper folded in a square in my pocket and a pen. So I can make notes if I need to, because we, when we first started birding, we didn't have cameras. Not everybody had a camera. I certainly couldn't afford one. So, and not a camera doesn't always show you every angle that you need to see to be able to identify a bird. So if you carry a notebook and a pen, you're set because you can make notes. And one of the things that I absolutely encourage everyone to do is make a note of where, and look, I spelled Joaquin wrong. I was a new birder and I started take, keeping notes and I went to the back bay on this date and I wrote the date where I was and all the bird species. I didn't keep numbers back then um, as to what I was seeing. And if I saw something different, I wrote it down and I made notes for myself. So I knew that this bird was a flycatcher based on its behavior. And I wrote all kinds of notes about what I saw, that it had a pink lower bill mandible, um, that it had a dark upper mandible or bill at that time. Um, it had two wing bars, um, a, a light yellow belly, dusty side flanks, which I found out weren't necessarily important, barely white edges of the tail, which I found out wasn't important, but I wrote as many notes as I could um, and a notched tail or wings you have to be very careful about because many birds and most every bird can hold their tail spread or notched or what have you so that really isn't a truly reliable field mark. Um, for a bird because there's all kinds of birds that can hold their tail however they want or sometimes there's a branch when they land between their tail. So here's another um, bird that I found and I later um, or I suspected was a ver vermilion flycatcher and I wrote notes and, and here's a bird, uh, a sace phoebe that I wrote notes about. So I was going to go through some birds, but I've noticed we're already at our hour and a half. Imagine that. So I don't know how much you guys want to go through this, but here's a male and female. We know it's a duck because um, their bill is a particular um, spatulate shape. Um, this is a, a, another duck with a similar spatula, but look how different the shape is and the coloration of this bill. Um, I'm sure many of you know this American widgeon, but some of you may not. And we notice that the color of the bill tip is different. And on this bird, you can see it. This is what we call the nail. And it is actually a separate protrusion, if you will, on the bill of mostly ducks have this nail. And this one seems to blend in with the coloration of the tip of the bill, but on that mallard did not. And on these feathers, this fine little streaking, I hope you can see, we call that vermiculation. And having vermiculation on feathers is also an important field mark. This bird has some vermiculation also, but Notice, I don't know, I'm sure you all have seen mallards and this is an American widgeon. These birds are dabbling ducks and you can't really see based on, well, here's hers and his are kind of here maybe. Those are dabbling ducks and this is a diving duck. And we can tell because his legs are placed farther back on his body 
And also, if you notice, it's got a clam. So it went down to the bottom to get that clam. And here's that nail. And on this particular species, this is a lesser scop. The color of the bill and the width of that nail is important. And then you have a stiff um, tailed duck, like this ruddy duck. And here, again, the feet are placed way back on the end of the body. And that tells you that's a diving duck. Well, this is super important on ducks. And this is a patch of feathers, which is actually part of the secondaries that we call the speculum. And the speculum is actually um, colored like this, and it's different on most ducks. There are a few species that have similar colored speculum, but I'll tell you that the mallard is the only one that has these white outer stripes and these black inner stripes with blue in the center. So if you see a bird flying by and you see that speculum, you can identify it as a female or male mallard based on those feathers. And if you noticed here, here's some secondary coverts and here's some primary, or excuse me, those are probably primary coverts. Here's some primary feathers and those are secondaries. So those are folded up underneath the bird. And a bunch of this is scapular. So this is all a little bit different on a duck. And here's um, a, a northern shoveler in flight. And again, here's these coverts. So here is the secondaries. Here are the greater coverts, greater secondary coverts, the median coverts and the lesser coverts are all blue. So this kind of creates a whole speculum on this duck. And from really far away, if you couldn't see all this other beautiful bright color, you'd be able to tell um, that this is a northern shoveler. Loons are similar. They float in the water. They have legs that are far back on their body, but they're very low in the water, if you notice. And their head um, and neck is very short and kind of beefy head, and they have this long daggery bill. So loons have a long daggery bill, and you separate the species based on the stoutness um, of that bill and some other coloration marks. And of course, unfortunately, you've probably seen in the movies these beautiful loons, and you hear them calling, and they make these beautiful sounds. Well, when we see them, they look like this. It's the winter, so they're in their basic plumage. We don't get to see them often in their breeding or alternate plumage when they're all really pretty and colorful. Uh, so Peter is asking when birds molt, do the new feather, feathers grow from the older feather bases or new ones? So yes, they do grow in the same um, shaft hole, if you will, so they're essentially just like your pet bird, they're pushing the old feathers out to grow in the new one. So when they molt, they are growing in the same tracks as the old. So this is a grebe and grebes also are low in the water, but they have a really long neck. So they look different from a loon. And of course I mentioned in my write up that um, habitat is gonna have a lot to do with where you're finding these birds. Loons in the winter time for us are off the coast. So even at Upper Newport Bay, although I took this picture of this loon at Upper Newport Bay, I was way by the bridge over PCH out by um, the entrance to the bay. So these birds are often seen off the pier uh, Newport Pier, Huntington Pier, or perhaps Bolsa Chica, but they're out in the um, open ocean mostly. And grebes um, can be found far inland, and these will also um, be in freshwater. But they do have a really long neck, which separates them, and their bill is not nearly as stout. It's very pointed, but not nearly as stout at the base as a loon. And that's a long necked grebe, but we also have small little grebes and the whole grebe itself is small. But these small little grebes have these fluffy little bums. And so those feathers often are fluffed up in the back 
and they have a cute little bill and they're very tiny. So this is a pied-billed grebe and looks very different than a long-billed grebe, but um, it's still a grebe. And I was gonna ask you guys if you wanted to take a quiz and decide what type of bird this is. I know some of you may actually know um, the species even um, without the minutia detail um, on these feathers that we've been talking about, but I don't know. Does anybody really wanna go through this? I know I'm running really um, out of time, so I'm not seeing any excitement. <laughs> so I'm just gonna rush through these then. I'm getting chat. Oh wait, I'm getting chat. Okay. Homework. Well, I wish I could um, give you homework, but I, I'd have to share the whole presentation. So I'm just going to go through. Well, why don't you take out your paper and pencil? I'll go through these really quick and show you the photos. You can write down whatever it is that you think you know, whether it be um, a species name or a type of bird or what have you. Uh, and then um, we'll come back and I'll tell you what they are. How's that? So write down whatever you think about number one, what, however much or as little as you want to write down. And then this is number two. So these are ducks, loons, or grebes. I have 10 birds, so this is number four. This is number five. This is number six. Number eight. Number nine and number 10. Okay, let me go back. Does anybody want to raise their hand or chat or? I'm not sure which one you were talking about, um, Kim, but so does anybody have a guess for number one? Anybody want to raise their hand and stick their neck out? No? Okay, what type of bird is it, Heather? Do you know what type of bird it is? I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay, there's stuff coming in the chat. Okay, so there's some good answers here. This is a dabbling duck and we know it's a dabbling duck because it's standing on the land, right? So if you're a diving duck and your feet are placed way back on the back of your body, it's incredibly difficult for you to stand up and balance the whole rest of your body above ground. So that's a great answer, dabbling duck. Um, no, it's not. So someone did have the right answer. This is a gadwall. And this is a gadwall. It's a dabbling duck. And one of the characteristics of the gadwall uh, compared to other ducks, and of course it's got this spatulate kind of bell like a duck, is that the gadwall has this very steep and straight forehead. Whereas other birds, their forehead might slope over and kind of 
not be quite as strongly forehead. So that is one of the characteristics and it's kind of square headed. And that is also a characteristic of a gadwall. And of course, if you knew this about gadwall, gadwalls have a white speculum and this bird happens to be showing its speculum. But when birds are on the ground like this, their wing coverts and these are the scapulars could cover over that speculum and you wouldn't see that at all. So you wouldn't necessarily know that um, that's what the speculum color is. How about this bird? Anybody got a gander, a guess on what this bird is? What type of bird? Okay, some answers are coming in, let's see. Okay, yeah, there's quite a few right answers. This is a grebe. And this is a, a, um, a, one of the smaller grebes. This is actually a horned grebe. And this bird occurs mostly at, um, at the coast or um, really in the ocean. This is actually a horned grebe. And we know this is a horned grebe because this white comes almost all the way to the back of the neck. There's quite a bit of white here. And if there were some folks um, suggesting perhaps eared grebe, but this bill is a little bit more stout than an eared grebe. An eared grebe would have a little bit thinner of a bill, but that's a really good guess. It's a lookalike kind of. And of course it's got this poopy butt. So that makes it um, one of the smaller grebes. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So someone's asking, where are the horns? Well, remember for many of our birds, uh, especially waterfowl and other water type birds, these birds are here in the winter time for us. And so they're breeding, uh, especially ducks, um, some are, uh, are arboreal, uh, they're actually nesting in cavities in trees, some of these ducks. This is a grebe, but they're, they're breeding far north, Alaska, prairie potholes, um, you know, and beyond. And so they're here um, in the wintertime in their basic plumage. Now, this particular bird has quite a bit of red here. And in the breeding season, this horned grebe gets... Um, quite a bit of red skin and eyes around its bill, but it also gets these big um, horns of feathers. Uh, it molts into an alternate plumage where it has a, a more pretty breeding colors um, that we don't often see. We get to see them looking like this, which is often a problem when you're trying to identify out of town warblers because they don't look as pretty as they do in the book we get the winter bird, we don't get the pretty spring bird. So it would be much easier if we got to see the pretty spring bird, but we don't get that. So depending on the species, we have to, our work is cut out for us. And that's why understanding these terms and these field marks is so important. So here is your eared grebe. And this is in breeding plumage. So it gets these beautiful breeding plumes, these golden feathers around its head. And actually in the winter, it looks very much like the horned grebe. It has none of these colorful feathers. It has white and black on its neck. But see, even in this plumage, you can see the bill shape is a little bit skinnier, not quite as stout at the base. It's black, which actually may change with mating or breeding. So um, yeah, let's go. Let's go to Alaska. They're saying, let's go. So I'm there. I've never been to Alaska. I'd love to go to Alaska. <clears throat> so here is our Northern Shoveler and Northern Shoveler has this huge spatulate bill. And you can actually see that. I have a great photo. I didn't put it in here. I had one under, I was under one and the bill looks like this huge spoon. In fact, the hunters call them spooners because this bill is huge flying over me. It looks like this big spatula. But the cool thing about northern shovelers, and unfortunately you can't see it well in this photo, right here you can see a crease and they have 
these um, hair-like structures very similar to what a baleen whale has, but they are called lamellae. And these little lamellae are like a baleen whale and they are a filter feeder. So they actually kind of filter the water through these lamellae and filter in um, food. In, and that's part of why they have this huge bill. But look at these beautiful colors they get um, when they're in breeding plumage. So this is a male northern shoveler. And this is um, a, a duck that occurs at the ocean or in the sea. This is a surf scoter. And it occurs at Bolsa Chica, sometimes at the mouth of the bay, but out in the ocean. And it's got this really fabulous, crazy bill. Yes, and it is a diving duck. So this is a diver. You can see how far back on the body these legs are. And actually this brown is kind of interesting because um, birds that have browns and dark feathers will fade with the sun. And so this brown is really an effect of being exposed to the sun more so than it is the color of the bird. So again, that's something that's gonna vary with age and exposure to the environment. And of course, I hope you guys knew this was a grebe with this cute little bum feathers. And this is an eared grebe and see how different it looks from that breeding bird. It's got this floofy neck and I'm showing you a back angle for those more experienced birders. This is a dabbler, obviously dabbling. This is also a duck. We've got that spoon-ish bill, but this is not quite as spatulate as some of the others. But one of the important features of this, this is a northern pintail, is this vermiculation here on the sides and the fact that this bill is blue. That's an important feature. Um, I'm sorry, number seven was a actually a dabbling duck and it was a northern shoveler. So let me show you real quick how we know that's a northern shoveler. See the rufous flanks and the white and the black and the feathers. So let's go look at the bum in the air. See rufous flanks, white, black, and this is the speculum showing through. And I haven't shown you the speculum in a while, but those feathers are there. So what did you guys do with this bird? I'm curious. What do you call on this bird? Is this a loon, a grebe, or a duck? Anybody? Oh, look, lots of chat. Okay. Okay, great. I'm getting stuff from all over the spectrum. I have someone saying this is not a duck. Some are suggesting a loon, a merganser, a grebe. So we're all over the place, which is exactly what I figured you might do. That's the ringer. So this is actually a duck. And um, whoever said it was, oh, someone even had a cormorant. So whoever, um, called it a merganser is correct. A merganser is a type of duck. And we know this is a duck because many of the characteristics are the same. Even though, look at that bill. That bill is totally different than any of the ducks we've talked about. It does not have a spatulate bill at all. But it does have a speculum. It does have legs in the back, but so does a loon and a grebe. So that doesn't help us, but um, it, it is, well, we know it's a water bird because it's wet, but the main clincher for us is the speculum. It has this identifying mark where loons and grebes do not have a speculum like this, but ducks do. And although the head shape is different and it's tough to tell with the head in flight because they can all hold their head differently when they're flying. But um, that bill, yeah, so someone has guessed this correctly. This is a red-breasted merganser. 
And a merganser is a type of duck, but mergansers have this really crazy fancy bill that allows them to dive. As we can see, look how far back these feet are, way back on the body, which means if you ever see this bird outside of the water trying to walk on land, it needs help because these birds don't walk on land. Their legs are way too far back for them to put all that up in the air to be able to walk. But this is a duck. It is a diving duck and it specializes in eating fish and crawfish and things. And so actually you can't see it in this photo. I know I have one somewhere. That bill has little serrations on the, uh, well, maybe you could see it if I were able to, let me see if I can, I don't know if I can. I don't think I can. If I could zoom in, you might be able to see, you kind of can see right there. There's little serrations in that bill that allow it to grab onto fish. So how about this one? Anybody? Duck, grebe, <laughs> she's over it. <laughs> this is also a diving duck. Its bill is not quite as spatulate as some of the others, but it is a diving duck. And we do have some um, more experienced birders here than others. And yes, this is um, a golden eye. This is a common golden eye. And this is actually a rare duck for us in the winter time. We occasionally get them one or two in the county. Um, this I took in San Juan Capistrano during a Christmas bird count. And um, there have been sightings at Bolsa Chica mostly. Um, this I took in San Juan Capistrano at a little private golf course, but um, we have even had them in Upper Newport Bay. I know um, uh, boy, his name escapes me because I'm thinking about his his photos um, later on. But um, we've had these at Upper Newport Bay as well. Okay, so here's that floater. And here you can see the serration in the bill um, of the red-breasted merganser, and that's a female. So it is a duck. And here, oh, here you can really see that serration. That's fantastic. So, but you can see the speculum. So we know that this is a duck and not a loon, but that was a good guess. And loons actually have a much more pointy bill and it is still stout, so good guess. And just so you know, <laughs> these birds that have these legs at the back of their body, they actually have to run across the surface of the water to take flight. It's not like the dabblers or other um, ducks, they can just like burst off the surface of the water like mallards, you just see them take off. These birds can't do that. Their legs are far too far back on their body. So they have to run across the water to take flight much like a cormorant because their legs too are placed in the back of their body. But this little pied-billed grebe, these are jumping fish. These are tiny little fish that are jumping out of the water. And this, this little pied-billed grebe got so scared. <laughs> it was running on the surface of the water to get away from these tiny little jumping fish. It was the cutest thing ever. <laughs> anyway, here's some quick birching birds. This is a wren. They often hold their tail cocked. They have a fine, tiny little tweezer-like bill. And these birds eat insects. Oftentimes, wrens have something of a supercilium. This shows a teeny bit of one. This is a house wren. This is a Buick's wren. This is found more in the scrub. They all have this fine, often fine banding on their tails. Again, a fine little bill that eats insects and a big white supercilium on the Buick's wren. And this is a rock wren. And I actually took this at Upper Newport Bay right by the sign of the, for the Moose Center. It too has a little supercilium. They aren't quite as plentiful in Orange County as um, some of the others because of habitat. They want a rocky dry habitat. And so this guy was be bopping around near the parking lot, but they have little dots and they still have little striping on their tail, but they have dots on their breast and on their wings and they're very cute. Finches, 
have a big round bulbousy kind of bill. And this center, the center, how do you say, um, where the bill comes together in the center, we have a term called Coleman. So this center portion uh, or apex, maybe is a good word, um, for this bill is called the Coleman. And this is a little bit curved, but look how bulbousy this bill is. It's round and, and we know that's a seed cruncher. So the fact that this is a seed cruncher makes that a finch. And of course, this is another little finch. There's some little finches that we have. It has more of a straight Coleman, but yet it has still the seed crunching bill and it kind of curves out at the edges. And that tells us that that's a finch. Sparrows also have a seed eating bill, but their bill is a little bit straighter on all sides and their their Coleman is straight. It's not kind of bulbousy and curved like a finch would have. So we have streaky breasted sparrows and we also have plain breasted sparrows. So if you're looking at a bird that has this seed eating bill and it's got a straight Coleman or relatively pretty straight, that's pretty straight. It's not very bulbousy. So you probably have a finch you can cut your work in half if you look at that and say it's a plain breasted sparrow versus a streaky breasted sparrow so you can cut the book in half and say oh i'm dealing with a plain breasted sparrow here's a streaky breasted sparrow and again this sparrow has this supra laurel area that looks yellow this is a savanna sparrow. And look at these tiny little feathers on that orbital ring. So the orbital ring is the skin and these feathers are an eye ring. And on this particular bird, it's not really strong, but some other birds, those feathers that make up an eye ring may be very strong. But the other thing that we want to um, understand about this sparrow is these, we, uh, when they're shaped like this, we often call them chevrons they're kind of wide and spread out. So that's kind of important to know about sparrows. And then here's a plain breasted sparrow. And on this bird, we have to be careful because sometimes that's pollen, but on this bird, it's not. This is a golden crown sparrow. We probably won't see this at the bay, but look at this. Here's a lower mandible that's pale and the upper mandible is dark and actually part of the upper mandible is pale, but very often denoting these types of field marks in your notebook is going to help you separate some of these birds. Because if you forget to look at that and you go to your book and there's two birds and they look identical except for little subtle field marks like that, you're like, oh my God, I can't do this. So that's why I'm going through the painstaking information with you guys on this is hopes that you guys will glean something from this and go out and write these kind of notes that are gonna help you. So here's that malar stripe or mustachial stripe in some books. And this crown or fore crown really, cause the, the hind crown back here is not golden but this is the fore crown is golden. And here's um, a lateral crown stripe that kind of peters out, but underneath it, for whatever reason, this bird is, it's golden is kind of spilling over. I don't think that's necessarily normal, but this could be a young bird molting. And so it's doing kind of crazy stuff, but this is a golden crown sparrow. And here's another Savannah sparrow and look how fine the streaking is on this Savannah sparrow but still we have some yellow in the lores or supra laurel area and a supercilium. I know this is a Savannah Sparrow. There's lots of reasons I can tell you why it is. This is a flycatcher and here's those brisk, brictal 
feathers that stick out from around the bill. They're underneath and on top of the bill. And that helps protect their eyes from catching insects. So when they're trying to catch insects in flight, those brictal feathers help them. They're stiff, they're stiffer than other feathers. They're, they're mostly like hairs actually. This is a black Phoebe you might encounter in your backyard. This is also a flycatcher. And one thing to note about flycatchers also is they stand erect on a, on a branch. They're not hunched over like a sparrow perhaps. They're sitting upright on a branch. And this also, you can barely see, has brictle feathers. And this bird has its crown down, but some birds like this ash-throated flycatcher, and this is a Myarchus flycatcher. It's um, a genus that you want to I, help um, look at the undertail coloration of the feathers on the undertail that help you identify that. But um, this Sace Phoebe looks like most of its brictle feathers got broken off, but here's a Sace Phoebe. Flycatchers can hold their crowns up in the back or flat. And I think this one shows, see, this one shows that the crown is raised a little bit and the other one is not. And flycatchers can do that. They can raise and lower those crown feathers. Other birds can do that. Um, they don't always, and many birds can't do that, but this bird can, or many flycatchers can. Here's another flycatcher. This is in my backyard. This is actually a Pacific Slope flycatcher. This is one of the dreaded Empedonax uh, flycatchers, that genus. And on these particular flycatchers, the bill coloration is super important. And the eye ring is kind of important. Here's some warblers. This is the yellow rump warbler, but look at that insectivore bill, right? Little tweezers picking and gleaning. So many of these birds glean insects off the plants, whereas flycatchers fly out, catch insects and go back to a perch or go down to the ground and back up. These guys are gleaning insects off of the plant. And this is a yellow warbler I had in my front yard last weekend. Yellow warblers actually don't often winter over. This bird is wintering in my neighborhood. I don't see it all the time or hear it all the time, but occasionally I do. Um, it's got that same small little warbler bill that gleans insects. But here, here's that shot that you, you know, you're trying to see with your binoculars in the bush and eventually it shows you. But I'll tell you, this shot has everything you need to know to make this a yellow warbler. And one of the key characteristics, of course, that makes it a warbler is that tiny little insectivore bill and this belly that's nice and um, round. But these Undertail coverts on this bird go way out onto the tail feathers. They end right here, but the tail probably starts right here somewhere on the base of the tail. So these undertail coverts extend way out. And the inner web of these feathers is also yellow all the way to the end of the tail. And that is key to making this a yellow warbler versus somebody else that perhaps has a black cap or some other characteristics we can't see, but because we can see those long undertail coverts and this yellow extending all the way to the um, tips of the tail, that tells us it's a yellow warbler. Here's a yellow rumped warbler and a Wilson's. And this is the one you might confuse that with, but look how big that eye is on that Wilson's. That's a big eye for that little head. And there's that insectivore bill. This tells you this bird likes to hang out in the understory and glean insects. Here's a couple of warblers in the bath. This is an orange crowned warbler, which has the most tweezery bill. Look how pointed that is of all the warblers. And there's a common yellow throat. And this is where I'm giving you a quiz. <laughs> But I wanted to get really quickly in case um, someone else is on this call. I wanted to go through this tropical kingbird versus Cassin's kingbird. So there was something that came up last week or earlier this week about a tropical kingbird at Harriet Weeder Park. 
and um, tropical kingbird as, as well as Cassin's kingbirds are um, part of a family that's, um, or a genus really, that's very, very difficult to separate. We have in Southern California, the Cassin's kingbird um, in migration and parts of the year and mostly in the dry areas, we also get the Western kingbird. Um, couches we've had on very rare occasion. I have not seen one in the county, but we do get tropical kingbird. And actually over the years that I've been birding, tropical kingbirds are becoming more frequent. But if you look at your field guide, um, this is a wealth of information and they tell you even the habitat range and the type of habitat that these birds will exist or um, prefer. So it tells you their fall winter range. And of course in Nat Geo, they have the range map right next to the bird. You don't have to go to the back of the book to find the range map. So those are all really important details, excuse me, when trying to identify what bird you might have. Because if you think you have a bird and you go to your field guide, but it's telling you there's one that looks just like it, but it's farther away, you usually want to err on the side of caution and suggest that maybe it's the local bird and not the far away one. Anyway, here's the birds up top and here's the birds on the plate, the Cassin's kingbird, the Western kingbird, and the tropical kingbird. And we know um, there's a rule called Gloger's rule that suggests that birds that occur in drier areas are going to be lighter in color than birds that occur in damper areas. So the Cassin's kingbird occurs on the coast. So its coloration is going to be darker than the Western kingbird, which occurs more inland in drier habitats and tropical kingbird is in Texas in drier areas as well. So this is the bird that we typically have in the wintertime, the Cassin's kingbird. We do see the Western kingbird in migration and I have no idea what's going on with this bird's eye. <laughs> the tropical kingbird is a, <clears throat> I guess they might even call it now a rare but regular visitor in the winter time. We do occasionally get tropical kingbirds. I remember it was one of my first kingbirds I ever found um, as a new birder. Um, I had it confirmed by many people. But <clears throat> if you look carefully, this bill is quite a bit more stout at the base and quite a bit larger than that of the Cassin's kingbird. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. I'm sure probably a lot of people need to go. I've been going very long. Um, I just want to go over this real quick and I'll let you guys all go home, but you're welcome to leave whenever you feel necessary. The last thing I want to talk about is this breast color because look how palish and greenish this breast is. And that the fact that this white throat is not very distinctive against this lighter gray head. And the Cassin's kingbird has this very white chin and throat compared to a very dark gray head. And the breast is or upper chest is very dark compared to this tropical kingbird. Now, if you even notice in the book, all these birds show something of a forked tail. But as we mentioned, these birds all have two sets of feathers. So any bird really can land with its tail spread. This bird in particular has a, a tail shape that allows that to happen um, naturally, but even a Cassin's can do that. So <clears throat> here is a bird that um, shows a very large, very stout bill. And if you look at this white throat, <clears throat> it kind of blends almost into and isn't very distinguishable from this lighter gray head, right? This head is light gray. 
<clears throat> and this auricular patch does kind of stand out from this light gray. So this auricular patch is a little bit darker and is noticeable in this lighter gray head. Also, this breast is kind of greenish and not really gray. And this is very bright yellow. But see, this isn't a super notched tail. And if you notice, there's also some coverts, um, edge, these feather edges on these wing coverts that are showing kind of pretty um, loudly, for lack of a better word, um, on this, this wing, even though we're not seeing much of the wing. So this is actually a tropical kingbird. And if you look, there's not very much of a hook, which I don't know if that field guide, I think it does show a little bit of a hook on there compared to some of these others. But you know, a hook can wear off. So if it's feeding a lot or forging and going down to the ground, that hook could wear off and not be very prominent. So here's another bird. <clears throat> I actually took this just the other day. I think this is my picture. <clears throat> um, and I'm not certain that this isn't a tropical kingbird either. But I'm thinking Cassins, it still has some gray here. It doesn't have a lot of um, demarcation here, but it doesn't have a strong auricular patch here either. So I'm still leaning towards Cassins on that bird. But look at this bird. This is clearly a tropical kingbird. Tropical kingbird needs to have a green back. Its head is a lighter gray and its white throat kind of blends right into that light gray head. There's no line of demarcation. And that auricular patch stands out from that lighter head. There's no real gray on the breast and this is quite a bright yellow. And look at that honking bill, that is huge. So that's definitely tropical kingbird. This is also a tropical kingbird. You've got not as strong, but you've got an ear patch here. The white throat does blend right into that lighter gray head. There's somewhat of a green back, but this is all yellow all the way up, bright yellow, huge bill, tropical kingbird. This is in flight, but you can still see how much gray comes down on the breast of this bird. You can see a huge line of demarcation between the white and the gray head. And that auricular patch basically blends in with that darker gray head. So there's not a real standout between that auricular patch and that gray head. And that bill is not quite as big as that tropical kingbird. So this is a cassins. Here's another cassins. That bill looks kind of big. It even shows a little bit of a hook, but look how white that chin is compared to that whole head. No auricular showing hardly at all. And look at all that gray on the breast, lots of gray coming down. <coughs> so that's a Cassins. Oh, got my cursor on the wrong machine. Here again, tropical kingbird, greenish breast, white blending into the lighter gray head, auricular patch is dark, bill is huge. Now this I believe is a Cassins. The gray head is quite dark. There's no real auricular patch coming. The bill is not very big. The white is pretty contrasting with that gray head. And this is not very dark, but it's also not um, very distinctive here um, in all those other features. It does have a notched tail, but I, I'm just not feeling um, tropical on that, especially since this is the same, this actually isn't the same bird, but this other bird is the same bird that's being seen in the area that this was photographed. So there's quite a difference in those two individual photos. This is a bird I had a couple years ago, same thing. It's a weird angle, 
but you can see how up on the breast there's no dark at all. This is another photo of the same bird um, a couple years ago, and this one is as well. Green back, white blending into the lighter gray head, auricular stowing, big, huge bill. And this is another Cassin's dark breast. It's pretty bright yellow, but smaller bill, white's definitely contrasting with the head. And this one's a little marginal in between, but it still has gray not green, it still has contrast between the throat and the head. Um, and there's another Cassin's, there's another Cassin's. And I guess this one, I just so happened to go to my car dealer the other day, right when this subject came up and I took these photos and I'm thinking this could be a tropical kingbird. Look at that hook. There's white throat that kind of blends, kind of an ear patch, but I didn't even pay attention I just assumed it was Cassin's and I only took a couple shots so I didn't get any good shots. I lightened it here. Anyway, so I promised I'd talk about that. So I'll stop sharing now and thank you guys so much for putting up with me, for talking forever and ever and ever. <clears throat> that went a lot slower than I ever anticipated. I had assumed that um, we wouldn't have so many questions and we'd be able to get through it more. Well, thank you, Bettina. We do still have 26 people here. So oh, uh, well, a lot that's of people great. that were still interested and engaged and um, I'm sure really enjoyed learning from you. So thank you. Well, I appreciate Bettina. it. Thank Does you, it Bettina. is any quick question or probably no time? Oh, one more. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, you guys. I really appreciate the opportunity and I hope we can do this again. Thanks for taking so much of your time for me this evening. Appreciate it very much. Yeah, so thank you everyone for being here, for sticking it out. Um, thank you, Bettina, for sharing all of your knowledge with us. Um, I do just wanna let you all know that next month, um, our naturalist night will be exactly one month from today. So it'll be Thursday, March 11th at the same time, six o'clock PM. Um, and we will have Bob Allen with us to talk about the relationships of plants and pollinators. Um, so stay tuned for more information about that and have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much, Hillary. I really appreciate it.